and by Dr. Martin Luther King in their epic speeches. Theodore Parker said, the miser, starving his brother's body, starves also his own soul, and a death shall creep out of his great estate of injustice, poor and naked and miserable. I and yield that. Ladies, time's expired. For Move what purposes, the gentleman word. from Georgia? Move to strike the last word. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, first of all, I, just, I think it would be real interesting, my friend in Massachusetts, and I mentioned this to you yesterday, I, I think we would both enjoy to see what the results would be is if we Googled our hearing and put in the word hunger and put in the word obesity, which one showed up the most. And, and I uh, believe you're going to find we talked far more about obesity than we did about well, did hunger. Well, yield? And I, I'm going to yield to you. Um, but, you know, the, the question that I have is on the hunger, there are so many food programs out there, and this bill does have a $5.6 billion increase in food stamps and $1.5 billion increase in school lunch that maybe you and I together can focus on where this hunger is because it could be that there's a, maybe a, a, an ignorance issue more than a hunger issue, ignorance in that people do not know how to get these programs that are out there. Yeah. And let me well, yield to my friend from Massachusetts. Well, well, let me just say that I don't think poor people are ignorant, but number... But well, let me, yeah, let me, well, then let me reclaim the time because I'm trying to have an adult conversation and I right. clarified what ignorance means and if you don't know about okay. a program, then you're ignorant about its existence. Right. But now, let, if the gentleman will talk, I will then, talk uh, then let me yield to you. I, I, I will also say the gentleman raised the issue of obesity. and. The there is, an, there is a relationship between food insecurity and obesity, and poverty and obesity. Uh, and so what we're talking about here is the importance of good nutrition. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that a lot of the people that we are trying to target some of these programs to don't have access to good nutrition. They live in food deserts where they can't buy good food, where they can't affor afford fresh well, fruits let, and vegetables. So this is, we're all time. talking about the same... Well, let, you know, let me reclaim the time because I, I wanted to continue the discussion because one of the things that perhaps we could do a better job uh, at not only explaining to people where these programs are, but also coordinating the actual program. Now, the previous speaker said that some children, and I, I can't quote her exactly, might be getting four or five meals a day. I think it would be good in a time of physical restraint that we talk about, well, can we coordinate better? And let me yield to my friend. I think we're all for efficiency and important co good coordination. But I just want to read one line from a letter that uh, Secretary Vilsack sent up here, which he says that he is confident the proposed funding level in your bill would lead to a substantial reduction in the program, meaning the WIC program, uh, likely by hundreds of thousands of participants per month. That is substantial. That is something we but can that, afford. Yeah, and that is substantial. But, but let me say this. The numbers that we're operating on, 2010, there was 9.2 million participants. Last year, or this year, it's 8.9. Uh, next year, the projection is less than that because 450,000 people less are on it. The number, the base number on the bill would be about 8.3 million, but with the contingency funds, it could go over 9 million people. And as I um, have said to my friend from Massachusetts before, we want to make sure no one falls through the cracks, but I'm looking at these numbers too, and I know that the group that has been cited many times, the numbers that they're using are using a different base than what we're right. using. So I, I think some of this is actually about, well, what is that level? And, and I'm thinking it is the ni eight the, to nine million. The, the so let me yield to my friend. Yeah, I would also just point out to the gentleman that uh, there's another phenomenon going on here, and that is the rising cost of food. And so the numbers that that group that you're referring to is, is mentioned, I mean, we're pretty conservative. Uh, food costs have been, have been going up and up and up, and it, I mean, I think every f American family can, can feel that. So, as a result, um, you know, we're going to need to st step up and, you know, and, and not undermine these programs that, quite frankly, provide people basic nutrition and food. And, and, and I agree that there is an unknown factor on the rising cost of food that we're not sure about. Uh, will the gentleman also uh, the gentleman, agree uh, uh, with uh, me, though, uh, and, and but, we've had a very spirited debate, which right. I know uh, my but friend... It's, but it's not an uh, unknown factor. Food prices are rising. We don't know the percentage well, that <laughs> food prices are rising, but we do know that this budget would allow, with contingencies, 9 million people to participate, which is above the current level. Now, I'm hoping 
that the economy does turn around. But I, I think it's very well, the important. Gentleman, the gentleman it, it, I, I'll yield to my friend in a minute. I think it's very important, though, for us to be talking about some of these things sure. that are in the mix, like solid numbers, coordination of benefits, and also sources that people can go to. Because the gentleman I, said, folks don't know about I, this I program. want to offer some solid it, numbers. The, we want to help them out. Let me yield to my friend from Connecticut Thank with you. hopes that when my time runs out, my friend will yield to me as well. Because <laughs> this. Nice try. Time has expired. Do you need time? Because maybe we. Who can. seeks recognition? Can you get five minutes? What purpose? Gentlelady is recognized. Mr. Chair, I rise in strong opposition to the underlying bill where the House GOP guts critical food assistance programs that help America's low income and less fortunate families at a time when they need it the most. This is yet another chapter in the Republican attack on working families to give handouts to special interests. First, they came after seniors who rely on Medicare, and now they're coming after our young children and their mothers. Millions of Americans are now struggling to get through the worst economy since the Great Depression. And America's food assistance programs are proving to be an essential safety net for the jobless and low-income families of America. At a time when the need is greater than it's been in generations, Congress should be reaffirming our commitment to helping these needy families, not pulling the rug out from under them. But alarmingly, that's just what the Republican Agricultural Appropriations Bill does. This bill slashes funding for the nutrition program for women, infants, and children by $686 million. WIC is a program that provides low-income pregnant women, new mothers, infants, and children with nutritious foods and improved access to health care. This funding is critical to ensuring America's new mothers, babies, and young children are fed right and grow up to be healthy, happy kids. But these slash and burn cuts completely ends food assistance for up to 350,000 low-income women and children nationwide. Republicans, take the targets off these kids. Now, let's distinguish between wasteful spending and investments that help the less fortunate get back on their feet. How can anyone say that WISC is wasteful when it serves nearly 10 million people each year for less than $100 per person? To some, these dollars may not sound like much, but they mean all the difference from others like Amanda. Amanda was blessed with three children after she was told she couldn't even have one. But working in the food industry simply wasn't enough to support a family, and certainly not one with as many needs as Amanda's. She has one son with disabilities, another that was born prematurely, and a third that requires special formula. All these demands quickly stretched her finances and her time. She couldn't afford the basics for her baby, like cereal, peanut butter, milk, and juice, much less the special formula that kept her son healthy. She was struggling to get by. But with Wick's help, she was able to make ends meet and even found time to get her bachelor, bachelor and master's through online classes while raising her kids. Now she's a registered nurse working on her PhD, and it was taking that first step to join WIC that helped keep her children healthy and helped her make a better life for her family. We should be investing in Amanda and her children, the future of our country, not leaving them to fend for themselves. But instead of helping build a stronger American workforce for our future, the Republicans are pri providing more breaks so big oil can line their pockets. This same bill blocks efforts to rein in oil speculators that are manipulating the energy markets at the expense of American families at the pump. And in fact, in April, Goldman Sachs found that this type of unregulated speculation adds over 20% to the price of oil, and that's why our gasoline prices are going sky high. So what was the Republican reaction to this? They slashed $30 million in funding from the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which would stop this illegal speculation in the oil markets. 
so as they got funding from struggling mothers and tiny babies like this, Republicans are keeping gas prices high and pouring more profit into Big Oil's coffers. We cannot balance the nation's budget on the backs of everyday Americans just so that Big Oil can make big profits. Stop these cruel cuts to women, children, and infants. Thank you. Who seeks recognition? For what purpose does the gentlelady from Ohio rise? Mr. Chair, I move to strike the last word. The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I rise in opposition to the underlying bill. You know, a mother's greatest fear is not being able to, to provide food and security for her children, not being able to provide nourishment for her kids to grow and to learn. She worries about where she will find their next meal. Each morning, she is greeted by growling stomachs and an all-too-familiar sense of anxiety. This mother is desperate to provide food for her hungry children and depends on our local food banks. But when she arrives at the food bank, she finds that the shelves are empty. That is a time at which her anxiety turns to fear and desperation. She might, some of you might think that I'm exaggerating, but if you come to my district and visit the city of Cleveland and other parts of my district, you can meet people who for them, this is their reality. Just as it is the reality for people throughout this nation, who rely on essential nutrition programs like TFAP, WIC, and SNAP. The Emergency Food Assistance Program, better, better known as TFAP, provides food to low-income Americans in need of short-term hunger relief through food banks. This bill caps TFAP funding at $200 million, which is a $51 million cut, and in addition to that, another $12 million in grants for TFAP for storage and distribution equipment is also being cut. These cuts affect the storage of food that requires refrigeration, forcing many food banks to only provide unhealthy, non-perishable foods. And to my friend, Mr. Kingston, uh, there is indeed a correlation between hunger and obesity. 25% of the food distributed at Cleveland food banks is from TFAP, and it is some of the most nutritious food they have available. Even without the cuts that are proposed in this bill, food banks are face facing a shortage of food, impairing their ability to provide for their communities. Parents turn to food banks, especially in the summer, when school is out, when their children no longer have a guaranteed breakfast and or lunch five days a week. And if it didn't stop at, T at TFAP. Also on the chopping block is funding for WIC and SNAP. Nearly 50% of the babies born in this country each year rely on WIC. Proposed cuts to SNAP and WIC would result in hundreds of thousands of low-income women, infants and children losing needed nutrition assistance. These massive cuts to WIC would force vulnerable families to go hungry, to be completely dependent on food banks, which unfortunately are losing vital funding through this legislation. WIC provides food to more almost 9 million low-income pregnant and nursing women and young children. This bill cuts WIC by over $800 million, and it's estimated that because of these cuts, between 350,000 and 475,000 mothers and young children will be eliminated from the program. If we can just get rid of the tax breaks for millionaires and billionaires for one week, as my colleague has said, we could pay for the entire WIC program for an entire year. These cuts will cripple families and could have a detrimental effect on the future of these children. A quarter of the people in my district have difficulty accessing affordable food. But our, the chairman, Mr. Rogers, indicated, and I quote, this legislation reflects hard decisions to cut lower priority programs so that our nation continues on the path to fiscal recovery. To a hungry child, SNAP and WIC are not low-priority programs. These cuts will not set our nation on a path to recovery, but rather make it significantly more difficult for mothers to ensure the safety and health of their children. So what we are doing is punishing children for being poor. That is what we're doing. We're not talking about necessarily adults. Children have done nothing to us. I don't know how we sleep at night. The Bible tells us, and I know my friends like to talk about 
uh, faith, and I'm a person of strong faith. The Bible tells us that the poor will always be among us. And so we need to make the provisions to take care of the poor. First, Republicans came after seniors who rely on Medicare, and now they're coming after children and mothers who rely on food assistance. Who's next, Mr. Chair? I urge my colleagues to oppose this legislation and protect our children and pregnant women. I yield back. What purpose the gentleman from Illinois rise? The last word. gentleman from Illinois is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in strong opposition to the underlying bill, H.R. 2112, because of the deep cuts to the women, infants, and children's program. I've always been told that you can measure the greatness of a society by how well it treats its young, how well it treats its old, and how well it treats those who have difficulty caring for themselves. All of us know that there is no way that children, infants, can adequately care for themselves. The WIC program serves pregnant women through pregnancy up to six weeks after birth or after pregnancy ends, breastfeeding women up to the infant's first birthday, and non-breastfeeding women up to six months after the birth of an infant or after the pregnancy ends, as well as infants up to their first birthday and up children up to age five. Poverty and an identified medical or nutritional risk are two eligibility requirements. Nutritious foods, nutrition education, and referrals to maternal and child health services among the program's benefits. WIC serves 45% of all infants born in the United States. Now there is no way that anyone can suggest that any of these individuals, especially the children, had anything at all to do with their level of poverty or the fact that there is not nutritionist food available to them. And even if there were not food deserts, they wouldn't have the money to purchase what was available. How one can reconcile, can reconcile taking milk out of the mouth of babes or how one can suggest that some way or another we are spending money when, as the gentlelady from Wisconsin pointed out, the additional health care cost resulting as a result of the individuals not having basic food and care far outweighs any money that you could possibly spend. And so it's not a matter of spending, it's a matter of investing. How do you invest in America? You invest by providing for those who have the greatest amount of need. I know that we debate whether or not we are spending more than we're taking in. Well, there's a way to rectify that. We just take in more. We just charge people more who can afford to pay. I don't believe in overspending. I don't believe in having huge deficits. But I don't believe in seeing people suffer and die because the society in which they live will not provide for them the basic necessities of life. I urge we vote against this legislation, and I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose the gentleman from Georgia rise? Florida rises to strike the last word, and I yield the balance of my time to Mr. King. <laughs>
The gentleman from Florida, my good friend, is recognized for five minutes. I, I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I, I do want to uh, continue the discussion which we've had with our friends on the other side by pointing out something I think is very important. I have the vote from the Claims Act, November 30, 2010, of which I voted no. This vote cut WIC $562 million. So far, every speaker who's been on the floor voted yes for this bill. So in terms of following their rhetoric, it's very difficult. I also want to point out we had a vote earlier this year, or late last year, on extending the Bush tax cuts. I voted no. Did others on that side vote no? I'm, I'm glad my friend from Connecticut did. I also want to point out we had a vote last week on the Kucinich Amendment to get us out of Libya. I voted no on that. Not sure how you guys voted. I know my friend Mr. McGovern has been an absolute, uh, very consistent critic of the money that we are spending and the engagement we are having in the Middle East, and I respect his philosophy on that. But the reason why I want to point this out is because it appears that when one side tries to cut the budget, they're you know, pushing children out the door, but when another side cuts the budget, it's okay. Well, the gentleman yields. Uh, let me, well, the gentleman from Florida controls the time, and I recommend that he does yield to you. I, 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 I yield. Yes, he will. Thank, I yeah. thank the gentleman from Florida and the gentleman from Georgia. Uh, let me first comment on the $562 million that this has been, there have been several references to this in the course of the afternoon. Uh, this is the, 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 the truth of this effort. $562 million in unspent WIC funds were cut last year, but the cut did not affect any participants. The reason it didn't affect participants is that WIC foods cost less. There were fewer participants in fiscal year 2010. So the funds were not needed. That shows you because, the, if, because there was extra if, money if in WIC gentleman, last year, the, the funds... I reclaim, I yield. If, 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 well, I, want, I want to comment on that, but that's exactly what we're doing. No, no the, the yeah. cut that, in this bill... That, is the, but everyone will suspend. My friend from Connecticut. Everyone you know, will suspend. Like Can I finish? We yeah. will suspend. Gentleman from Florida controls the time. To whom I, does he yield? I yield. Mr. The gentleman from Georgia, he has the time. The participation in WIC in 2010 was 9.2 million. Today it's about 8.8 .8 million. This bill, because the level has dropped and is dropping, Cost. is at a level of 8.3 million, but can go over 9 million with the contingency. So I, I, I believe that when you cut WIC last year, you did it in good faith. I would only ask that you give us that good faith, If too. the gentleman would continue to yield, gentleman from gentleman Florida. If the gentleman will yield. I, I would just... I will yield. The gentleman from Florida yields yeah. to the gentlelady from Connecticut. I appreciate that. The cut in this, in this bill is different because it does result in the loss of benefits to participants. That's not my word, but the Secretary of Agriculture has said hundreds of thousands. And from our last conversation, which we didn't finish, we asked about rising food prices. And this is from the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities. I'm not making up the numbers. If the cost of WIC foods increases by 2% between fiscal years 2000 and 2012, the smallest increase likely, the proposed funding cut would force WIC to serve roughly 200,000 fewer people in 2012 than 2011. If it goes to 5% the food costs, you'd have to cut roughly 350,000 people. These are actual yeah, I numbers. My time. We, we I and, and, and let me say this. And, and I yield to the gentleman from Georgia. From Georgia. It, let, me, let me say, my friend from Connecticut will agree, though, that if you, on your side, had not cut WIC $562 million, that money would still be there right now. The and fact the of the matter was is that what, we, what, what we're not asking about is I'm not sorry, utilizing funds Georgia if you don't the, need them. We'll suspend. You've got to keep this in order here. The gentleman You're from right. Georgia has the time. The, the <laughs> point that I'm making, Mr. Chair, is that WIC is $562 million down, not because of any Republican action, but because of the Democrat action. And, and you know what? I don't question anyone's motives 
on this side, and I admire their passion. And my friend from Connecticut is one of the most passionate persons in this body when it comes to WIC. And I respect that. But we also have to look at some of these numbers, because if we're just airdropped into this bill, then I can certainly understand their outrage. But if we look at the long term, where WIC was two or three years ago, where it's going, and the fact that there are three contingency funds to pick up the slack on well, this, the gentleman yield. a number of other well, the gentleman programs. From Florida, yeah. And I also All wanted time. to point out, I also wanted to point out, the gentleman knows that there are no contingency or carryover funds. Time has expired. For what purpose the gentleman from Tennessee right? Strike the last word. I was recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Davis of Illinois brought up uh, a quote about how you look at government. And it was Hubert Humphrey who said that governments are judged on how they treat those in the dawn of life, the young, the, 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 the twilight of life, the old, and the, and the shadows of life, the, the disabled people with handicaps. And, and, and that, that is the way you should judge it. I sometimes think with this budget and what we're seeing here from the other side is they think that the, the way you judge a government is the way it treats the millionaires and the billionaires, the way it treats the, uh, the uh, oil and gas industry, or the way it treats the Wall Street, uh, Wall Street folks do the hedge funds. And I, I think if that's the way you're being judged, it's going to be a harsh, harsh condemnation. Um, my friend from Indiana, Mr. Lundgren, came down and he spoke and he said something about, look at what happened in the last election. Well, I'll tell you what happened in the last election. It was in New York State, and the people spoke, spoke loudly. In a district that in 2010 was strongly Republican, they said, we don't want Medicare destroyed. We want to keep Medicare, and they elected a Democrat. And the people are seeing what these budget cuts are doing. One of the reasons we've got all these problems and the reasons why we have more and more people falling into needs for the SNAP program and the WIC program and others is because the middle class is disappearing in this country, because jobs are being shipped overseas and we're giving millionaires and billionaires tax breaks, and we're saying everybody should share, but the sharing isn't going to the rich. It's only going to the poor people, and they're getting cut and cut and cut. This WIC program, Women, Infant, and Children, should be the last place anybody would consider cutting. It should be the absolute, totally last place, and yet the cuts are there, 13%. The, uh, the fact is those people are in the, the place in life where if we don't give monies to the food for the pregnant mothers, we're going to have more infant mortality. In my district, we've got an infant mortality rate similar to third world countries. We've tried to have programs passed up here to deal with infant mortality and to study it and to try to save the lives of babies, and we're not going to be doing that. If we, I've heard a lot from the other side about being pro-life. We have a difference on that. I'm pro-choice, but I'm pro-life after birth. And pro-life shouldn't just be, well, during a period of gestation. It should include a time after birth. And we're not hearing pro-life type statements and pro-life type budget provisions. It is all about saving money on the backs of the poor. This is something that is not appropriate, and it's something that I think should shame the other side. And, and Mr. Kingston's a fine man, and I, I heard him say he voted against the, the, the Bush tax cuts, which I did, and I got confused on what you did on Libya, but uh, I don't know what had, that had to do with it. You voted with Kachanich? Well, I didn't. But I don't know what it has to do with women or infant and children, except that they, they might not have to. Uh, uh, there's a whole lot going on in Africa. That's another issue. B bottom line is, he's a good man, but he's got a bad provision here. And he could see to it that we change that. And the women and the infants and the children are dependent on, on the, the man from Georgia to try to come up with a provision to help them. And I'd like to yield to the lady from Connecticut who uh, was. I think wanted some more time a few minutes ago, and I'd like to, to yield to her on this issue. I, I, th I thank the gentleman. The point was is that we are looking at the potential and the fact of increased food prices. That is, and again, the numbers are not mine. They belong to, to an organization that has very good credentials on both sides of the aisle in this, in, this, uh, in this town, Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, and are very clear that if that 2% increase in food prices, and that's viewed as the smallest increase likely, we will see roughly 200,000 fewer people. If it's 5% increase in food prices, that there would be a cut of 350,000. The Secretary of Agriculture said that the proposed amount of money would lead to the um, 
uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people being eliminated from the program. He also is very clear, as others have been, that this is not there is no carryover money. There is no contingency fund. And the budget, uh, uh, Center for uh, Budget and Policy Priorities reiterates the same effort. With regard to the $562 million, my only point on that was I'm willing, others are willing to say if the funds are not needed at that juncture and they are extra, yes, they can be used for something else. No one is saying that the numbers have to be static all of the time. But the fact of the matter is we are in a different period in 2011, going into 2012, where there is much more serious economic difficulty, rising food prices, rising rates of people who need these programs, and we're just saying, let Let's have the money that we need in Time order to move forward. Expired. I thank the gentleman from uh, Tennessee. You're welcome, and thank you, Mr. Speaker. Who seeks recognition for what purpose the gentlelady from California rise? Mr. Chair, I move to strike the last word. The gentlelady is recognized for five minutes. I rise today in opposition to the underlying bill. This legislation makes dangerous cuts to essential anti-hunger and nutrition programs. In addition to their plan to privatize Medicare, House Republicans are now proposing to cut the Women, Infants, and Children program, otherwise known as WIC. This is a much-needed federally funded health and nutrition program which provides support, resources, and education to low-income women. This preventative public health nutrition program connects mothers with prenatal care increases healthy birth outcomes, and educates new mothers about caring for their children and providing healthy food options for their families. In my home state of California, there are 82 WIC agencies serving over 1.4 million women, infants, and children. But the bill before us today cuts $650 million from the program, and these cuts we cannot afford to make. There are two WIC programs at work in my district, and I recently saw firsthand the critical demand and need for their services. I witnessed a long line of women trying to provide for their families and trying to receive the support they need to have a healthy pregnancy. This WIC office alone had a caseload of over 32,000 individuals a month, but can only serve 30,000 because of a lack of resources. In this economic downturn, people who never before knew about WIC now find themselves relying on their services to feed their families. These include state workers who were furloughed, nurses and teachers who have lost their jobs. Unfortunately, demand for these programs is increasing, not decreasing. With Sacramento's unemployment rate at 12 percent, these resources are not only needed and appreciated, but are vital. One recipient is a mother who once thought WIC was only about giving free food or formula to low-income families. But her perspective about the program changed dramatically when she enrolled in the program herself. As she was expecting her first and only child, she entered the program to help her family make ends meet. Throughout her pregnancy, she received nutrition information and referrals. Unfortunately, she was diagnosed with gestational diabetes, but because she was on WIC at the time, she was seen by the dietitian every month. With WIC support, her baby was born healthy, and she had the support she needed to provide for her family. But the cuts in this legislation do not end at WIC. The Commodity Supplemental Food Program, which helps supplement meals for low-income individuals, and the Emergency Food Assistance Program, otherwise known as TFAP, which provides food banks with food they distribute, are both on the chopping block. A month ago, I visited the Stanford Settlement Senior Center, which participates in the California Emergency Food Link Senior Brown Bag Lunch, run by volunteers, many of whom are recipients themselves. The California Emergency Food Bank distributes over 80,000 pounds of food per month to approximately 8,000 low-income seniors in need in Sacramento County. For many of these seniors, this is the only nutritious food they will have for a week. TFAP also provides funding for approximately 18 percent of food that comes into the Sacramento Food Bank. This food bank provides a five-day supply of emergency groceries 
to those who are struggling to get by, and over 18,000 individuals receive fresh groceries from this site every month. In addition to all of the cuts I've mentioned, the legislation also includes report language to stop the process of updating the school nutrition standards. It is essential for our students to have the nutrition they need to be productive and successful at school. In the Sacramento City Unified School District, approximately 67% of students are eligible for free and reduced lunches. Without an investment in proper nutrition, these students will not only fall behind in their studies, they can also face serious health issues. Unfortunately, the legislation before us proposes some of the hardest cuts to endure. I urge my colleagues to oppose this legislation and yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Wyoming rise? Um, Mr. Chairman, I rise uh, to strike the last word. Gentlewoman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the speakers have chosen to cut $562 million out of WIC, which would have carried forward into this year, and this year would have carried forward into next year. And that's because the WIC program has a two-year carryover. So when the previous speakers voted to cut WIC by $562 million, they truly were cutting money that could have been available now. Now the reason that they chose to cut that is they found a higher priority expenditure than WIC. And when they made that choice, they took that money out of the program which could have been available now. Now they did that based on real numbers of WIC participation, not estimates. They did it on real numbers. And the real numbers showed that WIC participation was in decline. Uh, we're now looking at about 8.3 million per month in WIC participation with about nine million per month fundable via contingency. We're looking at funding WIC at 87% of what it has been. We're not looking at decimating it. We're not looking at like some peepers, people have said on the other side, at levels that will cause children to go hungry or to starve, as one of the peop people said on the other side of the aisle. We're funding it at 87% of the level it's been. In addition, there are state food programs. There are county food programs. There are city food programs. There are religious organization food programs. There's the Salvation Army, 501c3 type programs, neighborhood programs, Meals on Wheels programs, food banks. And there are good-hearted, wonderful Americans who help their neighbors in need. This is an adequate budget in tough economic times and in addition, as I have said earlier, we are funding a net increase in food programs because we are increasing the amount of money that will go to food stamps and school lunch. Will the gentleman yield? I will yield, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I guess my question to the gentleman uh, is, does she believe we do not have a hunger or food insecurity problem in this country, that everything is, is being taken care of? And my other question is, why are Brazilian cotton farmers more important than pregnant, poor pregnant women and, and their children? Because that's another choice we're making here. I'm re reclaiming my time. I do not believe that farmers, cotton farmers in either the United States or Brazil are more important than WIC program participants. Do, we believe, do you believe we have a hunger problem? Mr. Chairman, our committee is only able to look at discretionary spending. We can't look at mandatory spending, and we cannot look at programs that are subject to 
the five-year farm bill such as subsidies for farmers. I think subsidies for farmers can go by the wayside and I hope that when the Ag Committee meets to restructure the five-year farm bill that they'll do away with farmer subsidies. I think it's ridiculous that we're paying cotton growers subsidies in this country that violate the World Trade Organization to an extent that we then have to subsidize Brazil cotton growers in order to rectify our violation of the WTO. That's one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. I wish we could have addressed that in this bill. I wish we could have addressed the categorical eligibility that is available once you qualify for one type of federal program. You're available for all of them, whether you need it or not. I wish we could address how much money people get on earned income tax credits. I wish we could make sure that 100% of the people in this country paid a little bit of tax and the rich people paid a lot more. None of that is true and none of that is within the purview of the Appropriations Committee with regard to discretionary spending. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. What purpose does the gentlelady from California rise? Mr. Chairman, I rise to strike the last word. The gentlewoman is recognized for five minutes. And I rise in opposition to the underlying bill. Mr. Chairman, it's often said that a society can be judged by how it treats its young, its elderly, and the less fortunate. Today is a perfect example of that. Instead of feeding women, infants, and children, it appears that the Republicans in Congress are slashing the ag budget to make room for more tax breaks for the wealthy. Let's have a look at how these priorities balance out. If we got rid of tax breaks for millionaires and billionaires for one measly week, we would pay for the entire WIC program for a year, a full year. So let's get this straight. During these times when there is a job shortage, where, when, if a person has a job, Wages are lower than they should be. The cost of food is very high, and we have low taxes on the rich. Pregnant women will go hungry, and their babies born underweight, so that someone can afford another beach vacation. Kids will go without breakfast, so that someone can buy a second home. First, the Republicans in Congress passed the Ryan Act, the Ryan Budget Act to dismantle Medicare for our seniors and for our disabled. And now they want to take food from the mouths of needy children and uh, women. Honestly, Mr. Chairman, I don't know how they sleep at night. This shouldn't be a partisan issue. There are WIC recipients in every single congressional district in this country. Red states, blue states, Hunger doesn't see political affiliation. And this is not some abstract political theory. There are real women and children in every single congressional district who will have to forego meals. How many, how many of us have ever given up a meal so that a child could eat? Or explain to a three-year-old why there won't be lunch today? Or soothe a crying baby who won't get formula. We should end the shameful spending of $10 billion a month in Afghanistan. We should bring our troops home. We should stop the war tax. We should tax millionaires and billionaires. We should create jobs and we should vote against this bill. Let's show America's working families that we stand with them and we will be there for them during times of need. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Texas rise? The gentlewoman is recognized for five minutes. I thank the chairman.
Mr. Chairman, I know this is a very, very tough state of affairs and time frame that we're in. Mr. Chairman, I also know this is a time when America calls upon all of us to stand not for our individual selfish interests, but to look at the country as a united team that believes in lifting the boats of all people. I want to thank my friends who have struggled on this committee, uh, dealing with the bare necessities of life, food. And that is why I come today, unfortunately, to oppose this legislation because it does not take into account that without sustenance and nutrition, the people die. It's plain and simple. We're not talking about knickknacks or trains, buses, highways, bridges, all very important and job creators. And in fact, uh, efforts that the Democrats have made very clear that they are the job creating caucus for the press and push that we've made on making in America. We've asked our colleagues to join us. But today we talk about feeding people. And I rose earlier today to say that it is in the DNA of the 18th Congressional District because one of my predecessors, Mickey Leland, actually died delivering food to starving people around the world. And he thought so much of hunger in America that he organized a select committee on hunger, joined by Tony Hall and Congressman Emerson. And his legacy was that we cannot do without substance. And so it makes no sense to cut $3 billion from WIC, a WIC program that indicates that WIC moms are more likely to have initiated breastfeeding than low-income non-WIC moms. Middle to high-income moms are more likely to have initiated breastfeeding than both WIC and low and non-WIC and, and non moms. One of the children of one in five children do not drink water easily. WIC children were more likely to drink juice daily than children not on WIC. 93% of children drink milk daily. About one quarter of all children had drunk seven or more sugar-sweetened beverages in the previous week. These are without the ability to have nutritious meals. This is in my own state of Texas, which indicates that food does not matter in terms of how wealthy a state may be. And so I can't imagine why, as my colleagues have said, we can't find $3 billion from the $10 billion a month that is being spent in Afghanistan and the monies that have been stolen in Iraq where we don't even know where it is. It's all about priorities. And so I rise today to express great consternation over the cut in WIC and to indicate that WIC is about growing, it's about providing nutrition so that children can think so that they can be able to be strong leaders. It is to grow children healthy. It is to stop disease. It is to provide uh, the kind of immune system that thwarts against disease. And in a state like Texas, the 18th Congressional District, which I represent, has a strong work ethic. I am so proud of them. But they also have a rate of poverty that is frightening. Food insecurity in my district ranks number 32 in the nation. That means that there are only 31 districts ahead that have the degree of food insecurity. And yet I'm going to have to go home and tell them that the priorities of this Congress were something other than feeding children and providing mothers prenatal and prenatal condition and after birth the kind of resources to provide for a healthy child. That means my pre-K little babies will be going to school hungry. That means they'll come home to a non-dinner. And that means that we as a country have failed in our natural values, that we all are created equal with certain inalienable rights of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. It is shocking uh, to be able to stand here today and know they're cutting Medicare and Medicaid, and now they add insult to injury that they're cutting food stamps and the WIC program. So I guess our soldiers who themselves, young soldiers, young families, on food stamps will suffer as well. But the WIC program that has gotten blamed for everything but what is right, and that is the Women and Infant Children program provides the nutrition for healthy children, and to stand here today to have to look Americans in the face and those in the 18th Congressional District who are 32 in food insecurity and say that we do not have the money.
Mr. Chairman, I'm asking my colleagues to go back to the drawing boards. Don't put this bill on the floor. Take it off because you are now handing to the children of this nation a ticket that says no food Lady, at the end, expired. no food at this table, no food. I yield back. For what purpose the gentleman from Rhode Island rise? Mr. Chair, I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I rise in opposition to the underlying bill. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in defense of 76,000 residents of the 1st Congressional District of Rhode Island, which I have the privilege of representing, who, according to the advocacy group Feeding America, are at risk of losing their ability to feed themselves and their families. That's because this week, the majority party in the House is ready to vote on a measure that will undermine the safety net in this country designed for our nation's women, infants, and children. Mr. Speaker, we all know that one of the greatest challenges before us is reducing our deficit. But we have to do it in a way that's consistent with our values, consistent with the values of our great country. And this week, we'll be voting on a measure that fails those values miserably. If the majority party has their way and denies necessary funding to a critical safety net for some of our nation's most vulnerable citizens, nearly 1,000 women, infants, and children in Rhode Island's first district will be denied the assistance they need to survive. WIC represents the most basic obligation we have to our fellow citizens most in need, food and nutrition. On top of that, it's an incredibly cost-effective program, serving nearly 10 million Americans each year and costing less than $100 per person. In my district, more than 18% of the residents suffer from food insecurity and depend on WIC to make ends meet. At a time when the middle class in our country is being crushed with high unemployment and still reeling from a housing crisis that has left countless families in foreclosure, we're seeing more and more people in need of assistance just to get by. And it's not just affecting people without jobs. It's folks who have a job as well, but they've been, had their wages cut, or they've had their, their, their wages diminished, or their hours cut. This is not the time to allow people to lose the lifelines they need to survive. We've helped the auto industry, we've helped big banks. It's time to sustain support for families that are most in need and have been most devastated by this difficult economy. And yet we see again this week another attack by the Republican majority in the House on working families while they continue to fight to protect subsidies for big oil and to protect tax breaks that are outsourcing jobs overseas. First they come after seniors by trying to end Medicare and now they're coming after women, children and infants who rely on food assistance. We should not be destroying programs upon which citizens rely for their most basic needs in order to fund tax breaks for millionaires and billionaires or big subsidies for the big oil companies. If we got rid of tax breaks for millionaires and billionaires for one week, we could pay for the entire WIC program for an entire year. I urge my colleagues to reject this proposal to ensure instead that families most in need who have been hardest hit by this recession have access to food and nourishment. We have the ability to provide nourishment to families and that's a cornerstone of a free and decent society. We cannot abandon this great responsibility. And I ask my colleagues and I yield uh, the balance of my time to the gentlelady, Grand, uh, Congresswoman Moore. Thank you, uh, thank you so much for yielding. So I guess that, uh, thank you so much uh, for yielding. from Rhode Island has to stand while this is going on. Thanks. Yes. Thank you so much for yielding. I just uh, wanted a few seconds to clarify something I've heard over and over again. Uh, we keep continue to say that first they have come after the seniors for Medicare and Medicaid, and now they're coming after the children. No. We ended the entitlement to AFDC back in the 90s. And WIC is not an entitlement like the SNAP program, food stamp program. It's not an entitlement like school lunch programs. And so what this bill does is it double downs on uh, not providing food to infants and children. Um, 
No, we've already cut the entitlement and snatched the safety net from up underneath kids. This double downs on that. We have torn the safety net for children, and now we're pulling it through the shredder for the second time. As a person who has personally had sugar sandwiches, mayonnaise sandwiches, and mustard sandwiches, I can tell you that funding this program at only 87% of its value will mean that we'll see a lot more malnourishment in our community. And I thank you, and I yield back. For what purpose is the gentleman from... Um uh, Maryland, rise. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. I wanted to uh, spend just a few moments putting our discussions in uh, context. This year, the uh, deficit will be perhaps as much as $1.6 trillion. Now, our total discretionary spending, that's the money that we vote here to spend, and spend nearly a year doing it, is a billion dollars. A bit more than half of that is the uh, defense budget. What that means is if we didn't have any government that we vote to spend money for here, if we had no defense, if we had no homeland security, if we had no EPA, if we had no NIH, if we had no WIC program, if we had none of the myriad departments of government that serve us every day, we'd still have a half trillion dollar deficit. I'm not sure that the reality of this has gotten through to our Congress or the American people. Another way of looking at this is that we have a revenues of about $2.2 trillion a year. But our mandatory spending, that's interest on the debt and our means-tested welfare programs and Medicaid and Medicare and Social Security, are several hundred billion dollars more than that. What that means is that uh, one second after midnight on January 1, we're already in debt that year, several hundred billion dollars, and we haven't even started to pay for the defense of our country for Homeland Security, for NIH, for the WIC program, for any of these many, many programs that our government supports. There is no way, there is no way with the meager cuts that we're making in these budgets that we're voting on that we're ever going to get to anything near a balance. I'll be happy to yield for a moment. Thank you very much, sir. We're, we're good friends. Uh, what you're telling me, I presume, is that you approve a $650 million cut from the Women, Infant, and Children's Fund. Is that correct? I, sir, was just trying to put in context our, our uh, discussion here yes. and, what it, and, and, and what it means. Right. But you, know, you, when we you, have a you approve the cut. Trillion, reclaiming my time, if we have a 1.6 trillion dollar deficit, and we're coming close to that this this year, you know, the Ryan budget was kind of an expression of his roadmap. And then the last Congress, only eight of us had the courage to sign on to his roadmap because it was pretty tough. This year, when he filed that roadmap again, I think 13 of us signed on. And then we had the Ryan budget, which is even tougher, I think, than his roadmap. But what else was there to vote for? And almost nobody read it, so we voted for it anyhow. The Ryan budget doesn't balance for 25 years. It doesn't balance for 25 years. That means that with that budget, with all of its austerity, for 25 years, we still are accumulating more and more and more debt. Every six hours, we have another billion dollar deficit, which means another billion dollar debt. And about every 12 hours, we have another billion dollar trade deficit. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to put our discussions in context. You know, I have 10 kids and 17 grandkids and two great grandkids. I sure would like to leave them a country better than the country that I found, and it's going to be really tough to do that. You know, what I want for us to do as Republicans and Democrats, 
conservatives and liberals to sit down to talk through this. How are we going to solve this problem? Grandstanding and making these political points is not going to get us there. Mr. Chairman, we have got to do something serious. I don't see the Congress doing that, and I yield back. The... For what purpose, the gentleman from Maryland? The gentleman from Maryland is recognized for five minutes. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Uh, Chairman. I thank Mr. Bartlett from Maryland for making the case. I tell my friends that uh, when they say women and children first, it means to save them, not to throw them overboard. Women and children first means that they are the most vulnerable and need to be lifted up, need to be protected, need to be given the hand up not the handout. Ladies and gentlemen of this House, I rise in opposition to this bill. And I thank my friend from Maryland, who, with, for whom I have great respect. I think, in fact, he did put this in context. We will not balance the budget on the backs of children. We will not balance this budget on the backs of women who need nutrition and health care. That's not how we're going to balance the budget. And the gentleman from Maryland made that point, I think, very effectively. If we cut out all defense and discretionary spending, we wouldn't balance our budget. That's the magnitude of the problem that faces us. But a great country, America, should not ask our children who need nutritional programs, who need health programs, to pay the price to pay the price of our irresponsibility because we have failed to pay for what we buy. But let us not repair to our little children and their mothers to pay the bill that we refuse to pay. While at the same time we pass a rule the first day in this House that provides for $5 trillion in tax cuts for the wealthiest in America, including me. I don't want a tax cut if it means that a child goes hungry in America, the richest nation on the face of the earth. That is not my priority. That is not my morality. That is not my faith. Lift up the little children. Surely, surely America is not a country that wants to see its children go hungry or it's pregnant women go without services they need for healthy babies. Surely, America is a generous enough country to feed those who need food. My faith tells me to feed the hungry, house the homeless, clothe those who have no clothes. I rise in opposition to this bill, and I rise in strong opposition to attempts to dramatically cut the food programs that serve some of our most vulnerable constituents. Erskine Bowles, a Democrat, Alan Sensen, a Democrat, a, a Republican, former member of the United States Senate, just issued a report. And in that report, it lays forth a number of premises on which that report is based. And one of its first premises is, do not hurt the vulnerable in America. Because, as my friend from Maryland points out, that won't get you to where we need to get. And we need to get there. And I'm going to work with my friend from Maryland, a Republican, and all Republicans who know that we need to get to balance budgets, to reduce debt and my friends on my side of the aisle. This appropriation bill would sharply reduce funding for the vital nutrition programs for women, infants, and children. Surely, surely Americans did not send us a message to go to Washington and undermine women, infants, and children. At a time when we are still recovering from the worst economic crisis in a generation, where unemployment is unacceptably high, where people have lost their homes, where people, too many people, 
are in great distress. Surely this is not a time to say we turn our back on you. This budget, this bill, pushing to cut $37 million in support for hungry, low-income seniors, not just women, infant, and children. This bill cuts seniors as well. Surely our people did not send us to this Congress to cut seniors. $11 million in support for our community food banks. Five, by the way, if you visited your food bank, you know that there is more demand on our food banks than there has ever been. Ladies and gentlemen, reject this bill. Stand up for the values of America and of our people. I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose is